In 1894, Frances Marion Crawford, who knew Edith Jones, who would become the author Edith Wharton, wrote a Bar Harbor tale of summer romances there called Love in Idleness. Bar Harbor, Maine had grown to be the center of civilization since the whole place had become fashionable to the Gilded Age rich. Earth, sky, and water are of the north, hard, bright, and cold. The village lies by the water's edge, facing the islands which enclose the natural harbor. It was and is a fishing village. In the midst of it, vast wooden hotels, four times as high as the houses nearest to them, have sprung up to lodge fashion in six-storied discomfort, but behind and above all are wooded hills. This was the setting of Edith Wharton's early romances. During the summer of 1880, there was a flirtation or a courtship between her and a young man three years older than she was, so not part of her older brother's set. This was Henry Lydon Stevens, Harry as he was known. Almost all these young Americans gave each other pet names. Edith was Lily and sometimes John. All that is known about Harry Stevens is that he had been ill with tuberculosis, which endeared him to Edith, who was also ill as a child with asthma and typhoid. And Harry had spent time in Oxford and Switzerland, but was now a sporty, attractive type due to inherit an extremely large fortune. His family was well known to the Joneses and not approved of. His father, Perrin Stevens, had been one of the most aggressive self-made businessmen in New York, known as the Napoleon of Hotels. He ran the Fifth Avenue Hotel, whose gaudy goings-on were in the Jones family's eye across the street all throughout her childhood. After that great success story, he built the Stevens House and turned it into the Victoria Hotel, the very latest kind with luxury apartments and steam elevators. His hobby was breeding racehorses. He died in 1872, and his widow, Mrs. Perrin Stevens, forced herself into New York society by way of Newport. Her trump card was her daughter's marriage to an English aristocrat, one of many ill-fated unions between wealthy, pretty American girls and English titles, which would make the plot of Edith Wharton's The Buccaneers 70 years later. Mrs. Stevens' shocking introduction of Sunday night soirees attracted numerous gentlemen followers. She went to the famous Vanderbilt Ball dressed as Queen Elizabeth and entertained Oscar Wilde on his visit to New York in 1882. But Edith's family were not impressed. Mrs. Mary Mason Jones, Edith's formidable great aunt, refused to have this woman in the house, and it would be one of Mrs. Paris Stevens' triumphs that after Mary Mason Jones' death, she bought that house. In the autumn of 1880, the doctors advised Edith Wharton's father, George Frederick Jones, to return to Europe, a remedy frequently recommended for American nervous exhaustion. Right in the middle of her debutante season and her courtship, Edith resumed what was much more to her taste, the comfortable life of Americans abroad. They went to England, and they went to a spa in Germany where she flirted with someone else's fiancé. They went to Italy, and as they settled for the winter in Cannes, in Cannes they made friends with a bevy of upper-class Anglo-French. Harry Stevens actually followed Edith to Europe. He was there in Venice and in Cannes, where her father died of a stroke, aged only 61. Edith was 20. How much did this young man's sympathy and kindness at such a moment intensify this friendship? Mutual friends thought Stevens was desperately in love. The life of the family changed. The widow and her daughter went back to America. Edith's mother inherited an annuity of $600 and a lump sum of $30,000 for a new home, and then came into substantial legacy from a relative. Edith also inherited money from her father, but she did not see much of it even when she turned 21. A legacy of 20 grand and an equal share of the estate with her brothers in total about 600 grand at the time in real estate holdings was held in trust by her older brothers. She was entitled to live off the interest from these holdings, which came to about 10 grand a year. Her mother rented out West 23rd Street and bought a new house at 28 West 25th, which she did up. 
Though the brothers were in the picture, Edith was thrown together with her mother after her beloved father's death. She draws a veil over this period. However, her courtship resumed. The summer after her father's death was spent at Newport, and the engagement between Edith Jones and Henry Lydon Stevens was announced in Town Topics in August 1882 with a wedding set for October. In October, however, the engagement was publicly broken off with a piece of tattle in Town Topics about Miss Jones being too much of an ambitious authoress for Mr. Stevens. The only reason for the breaking of the engagement is an alleged preponderance of intellectuality on the part of the intended bride. Mrs. Stevens is at the bottom of it all, one of Edith Wharton's relatives noted. She may have wanted to hang on to her son's millions, which he was due to inherit either on his marriage or at age 25, or she may have been getting her own back on the sniffy Joneses. Observers could not deduce much from Edith's behavior, who withdrew inward. It was officially given that she had broken off the engagement, and she and her mother went back to Paris for the autumn. She didn't appear particularly sad, a 15-year-old cousin said. Her vulnerability to the public eye was noted, however, by her escort at the Patriarch's Ball in January 1883, who felt her trembling nervousness. But there is no record of her emotion when Harry Stevens died of tuberculosis in 1885. Had she married him, Edith might, at 23, have been an immensely wealthy young widow, free to do what she had wanted. There was no free private zone for her where she could try out new relationships outside the circuit of family expectations and the tight jostling for social and financial status in Gilded Age America. Her feelings at 19, 20, and 21 have to be deduced. There is hardly any first-hand evidence as she famously destroyed many of her letters. But the public exposure of her first failed affair coincided with her father's ill health and early death and it is hard not to read mortification into these events, nor to see them as partial explanations for her marriage a few years later. Skepticism and intelligence were necessary weapons in the close relationship she began in the summer of 1883, a relationship much more important that, than that with poor Harry Stevens and which would dominate much of her life. A year after her father's death and the failed engagement, Edith was back in Bar Harbor, was this a husband hunting expedition? Over a period of a few weeks in the summer of 1883, Edith went walking and cycling and canoeing with a new acquaintance, Walter Van Rensselaer Barry. In her memoir, A Backward Glance, she describes these few weeks as a fleeting hint of what the communion of kindred intelligences might be. Then he left, and Teddy Wharton, 12 years her senior, immediately loomed into view. About 13 years later, Edith Wharton and her summertime love, Walter Berry, became intimate friends, by which time she had been married for over 10 years and was starting to write professionally. Berry came into her life at precisely the point when she needed literary encouragement and advice, and this is what he gave her and how they consolidated their intimacy. Much has been made of their false start in 1883 when Edith was 21 and Walter was 24. In the picturesque, unchaperoned environment of Maine, she found herself able to talk about what interested her to a young man with an air of distinction who belonged to her social circle but was also well-read and intellectually challenging. He stood out in several ways. He, while like the others, he liked golf, high society, and pretty women. But he was remarkable looking, very tall and thin, very debonair and elegant with striking blue eyes, which you can see in film clips today, and good bone structure. He cultivated a fine mustache from early in his life. His thinness was the result of severe illness. He had had malaria in his childhood and was perpetually plagued with poor health. This endeared him to Edith, who struggled with asthma throughout her life as well as vertigo. It is hard to judge because the mystery that settled around Wharton and Barry has everything to do with the survival of evidence. Who keeps and who publishes love letters of the famous writer-to-be was one of Wharton's favorite subjects, as in her first short novel, The Touchstone, which was written with much advice from Walter Barry. 
She knew very well that how her story would be told depended on what would survive and who owned it. When Walter died in 1927, she immediately retrieved and destroyed her correspondence to him, and she also destroyed most of the hundreds of letters he wrote to her over 28 years. Unknown to her, four letters she wrote to Barry between 1905 and 1908 did survive, friendly, intimate, but not passionate, tucked away in the papers of one of Barry's ladies, lady friends. Wharton did keep the letters he wrote to her between 1899 and 1904, and one letter, a telegram of 1923. The telegram, sent from Barry to Wharton two days before the letter arrived, read, The letter is really there. Don't lose it, dear. The letter was clearly written in response to some expression of memory or regret on her part, marking 40 years since they met. Dearest, the real dream, mine, was in the canoe and in the night afterwards, for I lay awake wondering and wondering, and then when morning came, wondering how I could have wondered, I, a penniless lawyer, not even that yet, with just about enough cash for the canoe and for the big harbor hotel bill, and then later, in the little cottage at Newport, I wondered why I hadn't, for it would all have been good, and then the slices of years slid by. Well, my dear, I've never wondered about anyone else, and there wouldn't be much of me if you were cut out of it. Forty years of it is yours. Dear W. The lost dream, the missed chance, and the long run of disappointment and compromise follows the lives of Edith Wharton and Walter Berry. The bypassing of the one true intimacy. The stifled lifelong longing. These are Wharton's literary subjects for which she was the first woman to win a Pulitzer, and Walter may have been, may have inspired them. All Wharton's friends from the 1900s onwards had to share her with Walter Berry. Ogden Codman described him, described him as her tame cat. Many of them assumed they were lovers. A number of her friends disliked him and thought he was a bail flu influence on her. Edmund Wilson summed him up as dry, empty-hearted, and worldly, a pretentious and unlikable snob. Others, and he had an astounding range of friends, from Roosevelt and James to Proust and Harry Crosby, admired his kindness, his sociability, his eye for the ladies, and his ear for what was going on. When Walter Berry disappeared, Edith Jones got married. The timing makes this look like a substitution, and so it may have been. But the intellectual replacement for Walter appeared a couple of years later, just after her marriage. This was Edgerton Winthrop, who was also married. Given that she was married to Edward or Teddy Wharton for 28 years, from the ages of 23 to 51, there is remarkably little trace of Teddy in Wharton's archive. There are photographs, Teddy with the dogs, Teddy on horseback. There are financial statements about the purchases of property and the building of their home, the Mount. There are very few letters from her to him, but none from him to her. They were destroyed before she died at her request. She does not mention him in her published accounts of her travels in Italy and France. His poetical works of Bret Hart, of whom he was particularly fond, he left all the editions of Bret Hart to his nurse. There is one novel of Wharton's with Teddy's name in it, The Fruit of the Tree, and there is a complete Shakespeare given to him on his wedding day with faithful love by his favorite aunt, Sarah Perkins Cleveland. A business letter of 1905 about getting payment due for an exchange on a motor car shows Teddy's hectoring side and concerns about money. I want my money, and I don't think Morse's note worth anything, and it would be only another bother. He has no desire to pay unless press, and he must be pressed. Teddy looked after Wharton during her bouts of illness in France and in the United States. Wharton's own correspondence is full of evidence about their marriage. There are many letters to friends of increasing frankness over a period of about six years about their situation. There are letters to her of advice and sympathy about what to do with her husband. In her fiction, there are plenty of husbands who are not on their wives' plane of thought, incarcerating marriages, claustrophobic partnerships, and squalid or ridiculous divorces. All through her writing from the, from the 1890s to the 1930s, 
Marital bondage, attempts to escape it, divorce, and the illusions of freedom are some of her subjects. It is very hard to find a happy marriage in Wharton's fiction. In fact, marriage in her books comes to stand for an inability of the genders to understand each other, and this creates strife in American life. One of her great strengths as a writer is her ability to generalize from her own condition. She used her own experience as fictional, as fictional material. She was married quite young in accordance with the conventions of her tribe and under her mother's surveillance to a friend of the family who seemed a perfectly reasonable, though not wealthy, match. She had already been emotionally attracted to at least one other man, but she was sexually naive and uninformed. The marriage was a sexual disaster from the first. They did not have a honeymoon, and her misery and frustration expressed themselves as illness such as asthma and depression. Though they took pleasure in traveling and motoring, and they were re-energized by the building of the mount, Edith grew tired of Teddy very quickly and sidestepped the narrow confines of the marriage through socializing, reading, friendships, and above all, writing. By the time they started spending time in France, coinciding with her breakthrough to fame, she was bored with him and embarrassed by him and had left him intellectually and emotionally far behind. None of this was disclosed directly, but he seemed to feel it and came down with various illnesses himself. The consensus about Teddy is that he was happy enough to look after her when she was ill, to run her affairs, to help with family matters, such as the funeral of her mother, Lucretia, in Paris, and the sorting out of the will, and to benefit from her income. He enjoyed driving and house building and shared her passion for little dogs. He liked best to be in Boston, New York, Newport, or Lenox, Massachusetts. He was very close to his mother and sister, Nanny, respected Lennox ladies whom Wharton found increasingly tiresome. He did not read much, refused to learn French, was not interested in ideas, and his conversational and writing skills were the standard of sports-loving, outdoor, wealthy American gentlemen of leisure. He did not enjoy Paris and took no part in the social life that Wharton discovered there and in London, and he likely felt out of place in that environment. Her decision to spend most of her time there, away from him, went entirely counter to his needs and wishes for years. Teddy's mental illness, which appears to be genetic, shows classic symptoms of bipolar disorder or manic depression, and may have been an inheritance from his father, who, Ogden Codman often said, showed the same behavior patterns before he was put away and killed himself. We cannot be sure when the condition first began to show itself because Teddy was always concerned with bills and that is not a sign of mental illness. Manic depression can be triggered by stress or by traumatic events, is often accompanied by a variety of acute physical symptoms and by compulsive drinking and can lead to suicide attempts. Really, if he cannot die, it would seem as if he might as well follow his father's example and kill himself wrote Codman with cruel glee to his mother in 1910. Wharton could have feared that her husband might do just that, and that was why she took so long to divorce him, afraid of destroying a dangerously unstable person. Wharton's biographers have agreed that her upbringing and duty and temperament prevented her from contemplating divorce except as a shameful last resort. The new adultery was unfaithfulness to self, told the modern world to Edith Wharton, but she did not agree. She hated the idea of scandal. She kept up a front about her affair with Morton Fullerton. She minded what people thought of her and felt the need to protect herself, anxiously trying to avoid exposure. Her family history was scarred by the painful feud over her older brother's divorce and by its after effects on her sister-in-law. Her brother, Harry, was also in a relationship she disapproved of. It took her a very long time to understand what was wrong with Teddy. For years, she tried to keep the marriage going. She acknowledged in her writing that many authors had issues with their spouses, including Shaw and J.M. Barry. 
She wondered among all the tangles of this mortal coil, which one contains tighter knots to undo and consequently suggests more tugging and pain and diversified elements of misery than the marriage tie. The treatment of, Ill of mental illness in the 19th and earliest, early 20th centuries in America, as in England, was dominated by ideas of nerves. Edith eagerly agreed that the baths and outdoor life would be the best thing in the world for Teddy, so Wharton and the doctors were diagnosing in Teddy the same condition she had been told she was suffering from in her 20s and 30s a combination of nausea and unutterable fatigue as well as depression that Edith battled for 12 years. But she did not think Teddy was suffering from the same thing. She was, nor does she ever say that she knows how he feels and extends empathy to her husband. Teddy's condition never seemed to strike her as being anything like hers. Neurasthenia, which is what Teddy was diagnosed with, might be used to explain a wide range of physical symptoms, such as nervous headaches, toothache, insomnia, eating disorders, sickness, lethargy. If neurasthenia was diagnosed as resulting from an ailment such as gout, which it was in Teddy's case, then the ailment itself could be treated by a doctor or a cure or at a regime at a spa. By the end of the century, treatments for the condition of neurasthenia were based on a program of rest, isolation from the family, feeding up, and fresh air. Edith herself may have tried some of these in Philadelphia in 1899 when she suffered a slight breakdown. But if mania or mental illness was suggested, then a different language and different solutions came into play. The diagnosis of neurasthenia was sometimes used to avoid the stigma of mania or mental deficiency for which a patient could be incarcerated, like Teddy's suicidal father. The mentally ill were encouraged to exercise self-control through a system of rewards and punishment. The concept of self-control became deeply embedded in attitudes to mental illness, playing into the states of guilt and self-blame, which formed part of the syndrome of manic depression. The turning point in Edith's attitude to Teddy came when she was firmly told by a celebrated nerve doctor that his illness was not neurasthenia, but an affection of the brain. At this point, she started looking into sanatoriums for her husband. In the summer of 1908, at the Mount, while she was waiting for the letters from her lover Morton, which did not come because he was living with an ex-lover in France, Teddy was better. As soon as they went back to Paris and among her male friends early in 1909, Teddy fell ill again. By now the second year of Teddy's poor health and the second year of her affair, nerves and other symptoms combined. He was very depressed, and he also had a very bad toothache. They tried a 10-day motor flight to the south of France with no success. They talked of his going back to the States, but he could not make up his mind. She was trying to manage something that was becoming unmanageable. She wrote, we are still anchored here by poor Teddy's dentistry, which is very painful and does not help his nerves. He now says he won't go away, but that is part of his nervous condition. When he is in this state, it is very difficult to make plans, and the only thing to do is to give him a sudden jerk at the opportune moment. A Paris dentist came up with a diagnosis of Riggs disease, and she clutched at this as a hopeful explanation for the incessant pain in his head and consequent nervous depression. He was indecisive and anxious about business, though in April 1909 she, he did sail back to the States to be with his family. Edith stayed in Paris with her lover. At first, reports were no better, although his anxieties about business proved groundless. She started now to complain about the attitude of her in-laws. The family seem annoyed with me for having sent him. They behaved exactly in the same way when he was ill before. Teddy went fishing in Canada, and some slightly better reports came from his doctor, Dr. Kinnicutt. The pain in his face and feet had improved. He was having serum treatment for gum disease. But his mother, to whom he was very close, was dying, and more ominous signs were showing up. He was attracting attention. His doctor thought him in an overexcited state and for the first time talked of his local irritations directly affecting the deeper evil, meaning mental illness. 
His mother died in August. His sister, Nanny Wharton, reported to Edith with a stiff upper lip that he was perfectly well and perfectly normal, but the reverse was the case. James thought that Henry James, Edith Wharton's friend, thought that the death of Teddy's mother might do Teddy good and take him out of himself. Instead, it seems to have triggered a phase of extravagant, manic, and reckless behavior. In the summer of 1909, while Edith, rather than attending her mother-in-law's funeral in Lennox, was meeting her lover Morton and friend James in England and spending her night of love at the Charing Cross Hotel, she was in the dark about what was going on in America and in her marriage. Dr. Kinnicott wrote that he was very anxious about Teddy and thought it would be better for him to keep up his interest in the Mount. At present, it is the one place in the world which he is most fond of. He predicted a swing of the pendulum if Teddy returned to Paris. So it proved. Teddy made his dreaded return to Paris in October with his sister, and they all stayed in the Hotel Crillon for weeks in between apartments. Brother and sister were indecisive and changed their minds endlessly about what to do and where to go. The combination was more than Edith could stand. After numerous plans and variations of plans and modifications of the variations and deviations from the modifications, Teddy and Nanny left for POW. Edith noticed her husband was overexcited, especially about business. By now, she was no longer explaining his states to herself or to anyone else as neuralgia or gout or toothache, and she was exasperated and unsympathetic. The whole thing is complicated by his sister's incredible blindness and stupidity and determination not to recognize any nervous disorder. I can make no plans, but only live from hand to mouth. The income from Edith's trust funds was managed for her, first by her two brothers, and then by Teddy and Harry Jones. When her mother died, leaving her older brother an unfair share of control over Edith's third of the inheritance, it was her husband who persuaded her brother to waive his rights. Teddy was also in charge of the business side of running the Mount. His own income was between $2,000 and $10,000 a year. When his mother died, he had, aged 59, come into his own inheritance. Teddy now told Edith in December 1909 that he had spent the summer speculating with 50 grand of her money, had lost a good deal of it, and had bought an apartment in Boston and set up a mistress there. There was also a story about renting rooms out to chorus girls. Edith wrote to her lover that he has put my affairs into rather serious temporary confusion and is of course brooding over this and trying to work it out in his poor confused head. I am so sorry for him. His state is piteous. And I feel, oh irony, that if I had been less delicate, less desirous of letting him feel that he was completely trusted, things might have not turned out so, as if the disease would not have found another outlet. To her sister-in-law, she wrote a more severe letter, asking her what she knew. The sister nanny replied that she was very shocked by what she had learned, and she knew Teddy had been speculating, but did not know it was Edith's money. Teddy had been in a terrible state, but per Perhaps it would be better now that his wife knew how things are. He told his sister that his wife had been noble to him. Perhaps it could be all hushed up. Henry James, told about these startling revelations, was appalled. Is he absolutely bien malade, or is he only unexpectedly selfish and perverse? He told mutual friends about the quasi demented excess and sinister financial bis misbehavior of the unspeakable Teddy. But in this crisis, after which things could only get worse, Edith did not take the opportunity to separate and start divorce proceedings. That she was still involved with her lover, Morton, may have played a part in her long-suffering reaction to Teddy's abject confession. She sent him back to Boston to try to sort things out. He would have to pay back what he had spent of her money out of the inheritance from his mother, and put Dr. Kinnicutt, her cousin, and her brother-in-law on Teddy watch. She set in train the sale of their Park Avenue house, but she did not insist on Tenney's resigning the co-trusteeship of her inherited finances, though she gave virtual control of these to a lawyer and real estate broker and to her brother, Harry, she would repeatedly tell Teddy from this point onwards that the condition of their continuing to live together would have to be that he had nothing to do with the control of my money, whether income or capital. This was such a scandal that Dr. Kinnicutt thought that Teddy should be in a sanatorium, 
but Billy Wharton reported to the doctor that his brother would not be persuaded. He wanted to go back to his wife in Paris. She offered to send another to fetch him or even go herself, even though she was in the middle of moving house to 53 Rue de Varenne. She assured him that the sale of the New York house did not mean that the last links with America were cut, but that her husband was having a bad nervous breakdown to friends and the doctors had advised no more harsh winters in New York. Kinnicutt, meanwhile, was checking Teddy's story, which was turning out to have a large element of delusion about it. The chorus girls were his own fantasy. Although he had been living with an unidentified woman in her early 30s in a small flat in Montfort Street, in a smart area of Boston, which had cost up to 17 grand of Edith's money. It would be best to be at the Mount with him, Dr. Kinnicutt repeated, and failing that, she should not travel with Teddy without an intelligent, strong, and helpful physician. But this was not okay with Teddy. In Boston and Lenox, Teddy presented a pitiful spectacle. Ogden Codman reported that he had been terribly strange here and nearly driven the poor Willie Wharton's mad, too. He is so restless and cannot stay anywhere long, nor does he know what he is doing much of the time. His chief delusion is that he has lost all her money and nothing is left. He sits in the corner of the room and weeps with his face to the wall. This is his usual state, but he has intermissions of thinking he has made a vast fortune and going around with a wad of banknotes, giving them away right and left. He came back to Paris at the end of February 1910, debts repaid, but very subdued and depressed. He is quite lucid, but has acute melancholia. His condition is very serious. He cannot be left alone a moment, and my days are terrible, Edith wrote. I don't, do, I don't know a much worse combination. More confusion in his head, that is his chief complaint now, she told her lover a few days later. She went to England to visit Henry James. Things are growing rapidly and terribly worse, she wrote. A number of doctors were consulted, two Paris nerve specialists who thought Teddy was rapidly getting worse, and a doctor who had trained in medicine before devoting himself to Buddhism. After an evening spent with the Whartons, this doctor, Dr. Bigelow, gave his opinion that it was not just Teddy's melancholy and exhilaration that was the trouble, but that his mind his, itself, his consciousness and reasoning powers are not connected nor consecutive. This lack of coherence was increasing. These changes now occur in the time it takes to get from one room to the other. Edith wrote to her friends that she had been through a dreadful year, made very much worse by the Whartons persistently assuring me all last summer that Teddy was perfectly well, and that the New York and Paris doctors had been entirely wrong in their diagnosis. When they finally changed their view, it was impossible to induce Teddy to take any kind of treatment at home, and his one idea was to return to the Mount. Billy, his brother, has no control over him, and Dr. Kinnicutt in New York, not knowing what else to do, let him come. For two or three weeks, he was perfectly content, though very depressed. Now the restless phase has come on again, and his one idea is to leave. He knows not where. It is all very difficult, and the more so, as I cannot count on his sister, who is here, and whose views also change every moment. Teddy wanted to try a rest cure for two or three weeks, and when I spoke of it to the doctor, he approved highly. When it was proposed to his sister, she became violently excited, said she was absolutely opposed to it, and told Teddy so, and excited him so much that it is now useless to refer to the subject. Teddy has always been extremely self-willed, and has done all his life exactly what he chose, and it is hopeless to try to direct him now. I can only watch, passively, shelter Teddy as much as I can from worry, curiosity, and comment and be prepared for the fact that any day he may yield to some impulse, like those which wrought havoc in his life last summer. The respite Edith had in the summer months of 1910 to write Ethan Frome was a short one. Soon enough, Teddy was writing from the spa on Lake Constance that he had chosen himself, complaining of isolation, pains in his limbs, and boredom. There was no golf, and threatening to come home. A sympathetic doctor at the clinic told her it should not be difficult to keep him there, but some of Teddy's friends sounded more anxious. A doctor in Paris took Edith's side and said his wife was very fatigued and needed complete rest. I think it necessary to isolate her from her family, meaning her husband. Edith wrote a long letter to her dear old man. 
there would not be many more letters that started with this, evidently her habitual endearment for him. She reproached him for not giving the treatment at the sanitarium a fair trial. Apparently, you can't put up with a few weeks of dullness and solitude, and I don't know that I can find any new reasons for urging you to give the cure a little longer trial. We went over this ground so many times during the winter and spring, and that you have heard all my answers, but I will remind you once more that you had the chance of doing what you wanted at every turn as you have always had it, ever since we have been married. He had chosen the clinic himself and had promised to try and keep his worries and complaints to himself and to control himself a little. She knows how hard it is to struggle against anything in the nature of a nervous breakdown, but he must see how impossible it is to help if he can't make any effort himself. She cannot see what arrangements they can come to now, given that he has told her he does not want to be a passenger in charge, neither of her money affairs nor household matters. He still feels terrible about having lost money in Boston. As a short-term measure, she invents a scheme of distraction, a trip to the Rockies in California. She reminds him that he has often said he wanted to do this. He could go fishing. She could buy him an open car. He might be able to find someone to go with him. Think about it, she concluded, and don't see the objections, but the good side of the plan. The letter is signed, as to most of her friends, affably yours, E.W. Teddy wrote at once to agree. She set him up with a traveling companion, a Bostonian writer and social worker called Johnson Morton, who would take on the role for a fee. Then Teddy wrote again to say it was all impossible and he was going to another Swiss spa at Thun. Dear old man, why impossible, she asked. If you don't do something of this kind, what do you propose to do? You know you are not in fit condition to come back and live with me. Each time that you have been with me, I have tried to do everything to make you contented, and each time it has been a failure, and it will be until you are cured. Sooner or later, she knows now, she is going to have to find a way out and will need to present herself in a strong position. Her letters are weary, exasperated, trying to be patient, leaning heavily on the medical language of self-control, and they are being stored up as evidence as she dated and signed them. They would be kept in a dossier, and many years later, she would file them with some other personal materials in an envelope labeled, For My Bi Biographer. Their last attempt to travel in Europe made Teddy agree to the idea of a long trip away. Her Californian idea gradually turned into a round-the-world voyage, and they booked their passage to America so that Edith could see Teddy off from New York. Johnny Morton, however, was not perhaps the best choice of traveling companion for Teddy. Over ten years later, when she heard about his death, she wrote a sad letter about him, because he led a frustrated, wasted life, and his friends could never lift him out of the wretched muddle in which his youth and middle age were spent. It sounds as if he and Teddy were two of a kind, and that's partly why Edith chose him as a companion for her husband. And he was not discreet. Over drinks at the Ritz in Paris, he regaled a group of her acquaintances with gory details about the Whartons. Ogden entered a vigorous account about Teddy's travels in America with the recommendation that Teddy should kill himself, like his father. Teddy left Paris in early May, and once back in Boston, wrote an extraordinary letter to Herman Edgar, who was acting as agent for Edith's trust funds. Now, Teddy wrote with a mixture of pathos and aggression that he wanted a full list of his wife's individual things, and that he should be consulted before any stocks were sold. I don't like to be a trustee and know nothing about the property, he wrote. For 25 years, I looked after my wife's affairs, and I did well until I went to pieces two years ago. I still take a great interest in them, and I don't want to give it all up. I want to feel still that I know about them and can be of some use to her. Herman Edgar told Edith that Teddy was trying to resume the management of her affairs, and Edith, horrified, told her lover Morton that this is the result of my too niceness in not insisting on Teddy's resigning the trusteeship when he lost all that money two years ago in Boston. Her letter to her husband began this time, Dear Teddy, and ended yours, E.W. It insisted again firmly that since the fiasco of 1909, it was impossible for him to have control over her income and demanded that he resign his trusteeship and give up the management of any of her household affairs. I must protect myself from this recurrence of the wearing and unprofitable discussions about money, which have been the chief subject of our talks whenever we have been together lately. She copied and dated the letter. 
On July 13th, Teddy arrived at the Mount, their shared home that Edith had designed and decorated. There was immediately a terrible scene of violent and unjustified abuse witnessed by an aghast Henry James. Her immediate reaction was to insist that they should sell the mount and to tell Teddy she was going to leave him. He begged her not to. She agreed on conditions such scenes were not repeated. Henry, who fled the mount the next day, reported to his friends on the violent and scenic Teddy, who was not, however, as awful as the pleading, suffering, clinging, helpless Teddy. He told his friend Edith that she had no choice now. Deeper and deeper your dilemma, I know. He wrote, two things surely emerge clear. First, that it's vital to get rid of the absolutely unworkable burdens and complications of the mount. And second, that with the recurrence of scenes of violence, you must insist on saving your life by a separate existence. These scenes are by the nature of the case recurrent. She had to leave Teddy, Teddy now, he told her sister-in-law, or he would destroy her. Teddy tried to behave better. In fact, Edith told her friends it was grotesque to think that he was being a normal, reasonable, amicable person just because he was terrified to death by the thought that I meant to leave him. But the scenes of accusation inevitably started to recur, interspersed with abject demands for forgiveness. She tried to reach terms. She agreed to continue to spend the summers with him at the Mount and even that he should go on managing the place, for which she would pay him monthly. She could let him come and stay with her in the spring in Paris. In return, he would have to resign as her trustee and to remain on pleasant terms with her. In July, he accepted her conditions and promised to control his nerves and his temper. Later that evening, he came into her room and she showed him the letter he agreed to. And it all started again. You accused me of seeking to humiliate and wound you, abusing me for any treatment of you over the last few years and saying that you preferred an immediate break. It was enough. She said things took a sudden twist yesterday. She immediately wrote to her friends, telling them what had happened, and saying that she could no longer put up with Teddy's charges of cruelty, meanness, and vindictiveness. She had tried to do everything she could, but she was exhausted. She wrote a formal letter to Teddy and had it sent to his room by a servant, giving her her account of what happened, and telling him that she agreed with him that there was no point going on in this marriage. A few weeks later, a very good offer came through for the house. They were able to talk about it quietly and impartially and decided that they ought to sell. She was now saying to her friends that the mount was too expensive for them to keep up. The summer ended in disarray. Teddy went to another spa at French Lick, Indiana. Before he left, she signed a document empowering him to rent or sell the mount. At the same time, she asked him to promise not to do so until she had reached Paris and could confer with him. The Mount, that gorgeous millstone, as Henry was now calling it, was sold in September 1911. Teddy declined the responsibility of it. Teddy told everyone that Edith insisted on selling the Mount and thus deprived him in his old age of a home and his one hope of getting well. Her dilemma was made worse because it was not private. All through the summer, town topics which had reported on her engagement decades earlier was nudgingly referring to the Wharton's domestic problems. Teddy made a last incoherent attempt to find common ground, although Edith's account suggests that he knew it was hopeless. Learning French became his obsession. Why, that is so strange, Edith recalled, and we have been having a lesson and he has been crying and saying over and over again, my mind is going and the doctors don't see it. It seems to me that he's failing very fast mentally. It is too terrible. Oh, when I think of 10 years of it. Teddy left Paris in May 1912 and never went back to Edith's home at Rue de Varenne. This was the end of their life together. Her friends watched in horror and fascination. This was not an easy time to be a close friend of Edith Wharton's with the swirls of gossip around them. In July, Edith heard that Teddy had had all his teeth out. She hoped that the relief from constant nagging pain in his head would improve his condition. Even now, she was trying to think of bearable ways of living with him and wrote to him suggesting that they rent a house in New York in the winter. Perhaps they could even buy a smaller place in the country where she could write quietly and he could keep chickens. It seemed a far-fetched plan. It's important to note that acquaintances of Edith Wharton remembered that she was also very restless and she would be constantly walking, talking, calling servants. The only time she really seemed to get any rest was when she was in bed writing. And so for Teddy to be so restless really, really 
secures the fact that he was incredibly chaotic. Teddy cabled back frantically when Edith said she missed him and said there's a great ache. And he said, don't come, entirely disapprove of her plan, and sent a 20-page letter to her full of bitter reproaches for worrying him. Teddy's letters began to sound too exhilarated, too jubilant, and Edith noted that he was on the upswing of his bipolar pendulum. He was in a full crisis of megalomania in 1912, which would be followed inevitably by another attack of acute depression. Dr. Kinnicutt advised Edith she should never live with him again. Teddy met several delightful people on the steamer to Europe and was going to stay with them and brought over a high-powered motor and a chauffeur. He was much on the loose, dashing between London, Paris, and Monte Carlo, turning up on people's doorsteps, spending his own in inheritance and the allowance Edith Wharton paid him, drinking heavily, sending off bizarre letters, and striking everyone as half-crazed. He was noisy and topsy-turvy, vulgar, off his poor little head. In December 1912, Teddy suddenly appeared at the gates of Le Brow. He was dressing like a roaring blade of twenty. He talks incessantly about himself, his health, his clothes, his purchases, and is mad as a March hare. He told us that he left Edith for good. It must be an enormous relief to her, Matilda Gay said. Henry James relayed a vivid account of Teddy to Edith's sister-in-law. He is truly as elatedly and swaggeringly and extravagantly mad as he can be. One of the first things he did was to say, have you seen my gold garters? And then to whisk up his trousers and show them in effect his stockings, held up with circles of massive gold. He was showing facially strong marks of debauchery. Could this have been syphilis? And his eyes had a terribly distressing and insane look. Things were chaotic for Edith in this wake. She told her friends that a little child could lead her to suicide. She found that Teddy had registered all his various temporary brides as Mrs. Wharton in the hotels they frequented, rather a gratuitous last touch of ill breeding. As they were signing the register in France, Edith noted the prior entry of a Mr. and Mrs. Edward R. Wharton, her name, and observed with a slight smile and shrug, evidently I have been here before. In April 1913, Edith Wharton's divorce was granted in Paris. Different from divorce today, Edith relied on letters from prominent Boston socialites to bolster her case. Her divorce was finalized in Paris, which did not let reporters view the divorce decree. She had to prove Teddy's adultery, which was not hard to do. Divorce in France at the time could only be granted by matrimonial fault. The courts found gravely injurious behavior on behalf of Teddy. After the divorce was finalized, he had a breakdown. Edith made no claim on his money, but asked to keep her married name since it was her professional name. He assented. After the Whartons sold the Mount, their fabulous home in Lenox, Massachusetts, which is currently open to the public, the house was a private residence, a girls' dormitory for the Fox Hollow School, and a site of the theater company Shakespeare & Co. It was then bought by Edith Wharton Restoration, which has restored much of the property, including the British Lime Walk, to its original condition and oversees the running of the property and events for international authors. Edith Wharton, while being terrified of ghosts as a child and demanding that books in her home that contained ghost stories be burned up until the age of 28, started delving into ghost stories throughout her career, drawing on her own experience with an interest in the supernatural. As a child, she claimed to be haunted by formless horrors. She put herself and her own family in her ghost stories, including a Mr. Jones, which may have been based on her father. In 1942, the Mount became part of the Fox Hollow School for Girls, and residents reported unexplained noises and experiences in the living areas of the mansion. Following the school's closure in 1976, the mansion remained vacant until Shakespeare and Company used it as a dormitory and performance space. Actors reported the same unexplained sounds and sightings of figures in period dress. In early 2009, the sci-fi TV show Ghost Hunters filmed an episode at the Mount and over the course of three days reported audio and visual evidence of activity, such as the sounds of footsteps in an otherwise empty room and disembodied voices. The show did a follow-up episode in 2015. 
I don't know if any of you have seen the episode, but I found it a little disrespectful. They didn't seem to know much about Edith Wharton and called her Wharton in the episode, not Edith, and Wharton could have referred to her husband, so I thought they should have done a more research. Currently, the Mount offers ghost tours, which are a little bit um, they controversial. Some people think that they stir up ghosts and ghosts should be laid to rest during the summer and fall season. Staff members give tours of the estate, including the stable and mansion, and it is a gathering place for international writers. If you are looking to get into Edith Wharton, I really recommend her ghost stories. They're short and incredibly well written. It's so hard to write a compelling short story, and Edith Wharton does it again and again. Her writing is incredibly complex and magnificent, powerful, passionate. It's no wonder she was the first woman to win a Pulitzer. If you read her books, such as The Custom of the Country, these are not happy books. They're actually very sad and tragic. And for Edith Wharton to have risen above the difficulties in her own life, to write these books that have such staying power is really remarkable.